On February 27th, 2014, while Kyiv was in the midst of the chaos that would later be called the Maidan Revolution, Russian troops marched into Crimea. Less than a month later, Russia officially annexed the territory, at least according to Russian law. International law, of course, did not recognize the change of custody. In the aftermath, President Petro Poroshenko's official position was that Ukraine will eventually re-establish control over it, and that policy persisted after the transition to the Zelensky administration. But by outward appearances, at the start of 2022, it did not seem like Ukraine was making any progress on that, despite Western political support. International sanctions in the wake of the annexation had frozen Crimea. Its borders were no longer expanding. But Russia was approaching its eighth year of governing the peninsula, and Putin felt that the location was secure enough to make visits there. The longer that remained the status quo, all else equal, the less likely Ukraine would be able to change that. But then Russia announced a broader invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. And the subsequent nine months of fighting have revealed new evidence that Russia's position in Crimea was weaker than the outward appearances suggested. Ukraine's recent successes and Russia's many failures on the battlefield are a part of that. But they are not everything. After all, Russia still holds significantly more land than it did at the start of the war. Rather, the strategic and political decisions Russia has made throughout those nine months of fighting suggest that, in the absence of further and permanent territorial gains, the Russian position in Crimea is untenable. Ukraine also seems optimistic about its chances, and I suspect it comes from the same reason. We'll get to that reason in a moment. Basically, it is how Russia has made odd decisions during the war if Crimea is not vulnerable. But let's first discuss why, in theory, the peninsula should be a difficult target despite recent Ukrainian momentum. The first part of this is the military importance of the peninsula. This all dates back to the Russo-Turkish War of 1768, the construction of the Sevastopol naval base began during that war, and a lot has happened to the area over the last quarter millennium. This includes a 349-day siege during the Crimean War by the combined forces of France, the United Kingdom, and the Ottoman Empire, a German occupation during World War I, and another German occupation during World War II. Today, it is home to the Russian Black Sea Fleet, a critical component of Russia's ability to project naval power, not just to the Black Sea, but also, depending upon what Turkey allows to pass through the Bosporus Strait, the Mediterranean Sea, the Atlantic Ocean, and elsewhere. Crimea as a whole receives the majority of Western attention. However, it is actually the Sevastopol naval base that is at the root of the long-running tensions between Ukraine and Russia. In 1997, the parties signed the Partition Treaty, which divided Soviet naval assets in Crimea and leased the naval base to Russia for $97 million a year. That appeared to change in 2008, when President Viktor Yushchenko, a pro-West figure, announced that Ukraine would not renew the lease when it expired in 2017. But in 2010, pro-East President Viktor Yanukovych succeeded Yushchenko and signed the Kharkiv Pact two months after taking office. This extended the lease there until 2042. Of course, all that fell apart during the Maidan Revolution in 2014. Once Yanukovych left the country, Moscow anticipated that the new Ukrainian leadership would cancel the pact. So while there was chaos brewing in Kyiv, Putin took advantage of the window of opportunity and occupied and annexed Crimea. But make no mistake about it, Sevastopol is what Russia really cares about in the region. And as much as Russia's newly annexed territories have dominated news cycles for the last few months, they are just a bridge to Crimea.
a critical point that we will return to later. The other big difference is in the contrasting demographics between Crimea and the rest of Ukraine. Part of this is directly due to the Sevastopol naval base. Russians made up the bulk of the military during the Soviet era, which meant that Russian soldiers and their families moved to the region. Part of this is due to how Crimea was part of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic until 1954, when Khrushchev transferred it to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. The 2001 census, the only official census Ukraine has ever conducted, shows the end result. Crimea was made up of 60.4% ethnic Russians and only 24% ethnic Ukrainians. By comparison, Luhansk, one of the two Russia-sponsored separatist regions dating back to 2014, had 58% ethnic Ukrainians and 39% ethnic Russians. Meanwhile, the other separatist region, Donetsk, was 56.9% ethnic Ukrainian and 38.2% ethnic Russian. Basically, Crimea was the easier target. And moreover, 77% of Crimeans spoke Russian as their native language, compared to Ukrainian at just 10.1%. But back to the ethnic breakdowns. These numbers were evolving. The Soviet-era 1989 census had listed Crimea as 67% Russian and 25.8% Ukrainian. Much of the change was due to the repopulation of Crimean Tatars, who had been forcibly relocated to Central Asia during the Stalin era. In 1989, they made up only 1.6% of the population, but by 2001, they were back up to 10.8%. Meanwhile, from 2008 to 2011, the percentage of Crimeans who viewed Ukraine as their motherland jumped from 32% to 71.3%, a welcome sign for Western-leaning Ukrainians elsewhere in the country. Still, the same 2011 poll found that 51% of Crimeans viewed NATO as a security threat, compared to just 20.6% countrywide. Official votes back up these data points. The 1991 Ukrainian independence referendum only garnered 54.2% support from Crimea and 57.1% support from Sevastopol specifically. That compared to 83.9% in both Donetsk and Luhansk and 92.3% countrywide. And those numbers were under the impression that Crimea would have autonomous standing, which was a trial in its own right. Crimea briefly declared itself independent in 1992. Ukraine's parliament twice rejected Crimean constitutions before the parties reached a settlement. Things remained dicey for a long period afterward, with Ukraine's president briefly governing Crimea under direct decree in 1995. More recently, Crimea was one of the major bases of support for both of Viktor Yanukovych's presidential runs. Then there was the 2014 Crimean status referendum. We should not pay much attention to the 96.8% of voters in Crimea and 95.6% of voters in Sevastopol that Moscow alleges voted in favor of unifying with Russia. What is worth noting is that Western polling agencies showed that 83% of Crimeans thought that the more popular option won. And we would imagine that the demographics in Crimea have trended toward Russia since the annexation, with Western-leaning Ukrainians migrating out of the peninsula. But this is supposed to be an analysis of why Ukraine is optimistic about Crimea. So what's going on here? The thing is, it's difficult to explain Russia's strategy over the course of the war thus far, unless Moscow felt that its ability to administer the peninsula was falling apart. In other words, despite any of those demographic points and political difficulties with Kyiv from a moment ago, things are trending the wrong way for Russia. We discussed Russia's public motivations for the war in depth a long time ago, but it is worth revisiting the topic now, with the benefit of greater retrospect,
to see why the signs are pointing to trouble in Crimea. The chief complaint coming from Putin that was front and center in his war proclamation was NATO expansion, with the alleged goal of the war being to stop Ukraine from taking that step. You will recall how this essentially boils down to a power shift argument. By this logic, Russia thinks it can lock in more from a war now than a war later, once Ukraine and NATO have linked up. The problem with this argument is that its observable implications are not present in our current reality. Once the source of the power shift has vanished, there is no reason to fight anymore. Russia stops facing any long-term vulnerabilities, and so the costs of continued conflict incentivize terminating the war. Whatever merit a Ukraine-NATO connection may have had at the start of 2022 has long since disappeared. NATO has territorial stability as a prerequisite for membership, and Ukraine will not meet that standard anytime soon. But ignoring that for the moment, consider the fact that the NATO Charter requires unanimous support for expanding membership. Finland and Sweden applied for NATO membership back in May. It's November at the time of recording. Sweden has a new prime minister, and Hungary and Turkey have still yet to sign on. Again, it's Finland and Sweden, two relatively stable countries that are not especially likely to entangle the NATO alliance into a war with Russia in the near future. Imagine for a second that Ukraine's application for NATO membership received serious attention. Now consider whether Turkey, a country that still has regular conversations with Moscow, and has gas flowing through a collaborative pipeline with Russia, would approve the expansion. Given all that has happened over the last nine months, the answer is obviously no. And so if NATO expansion were truly the cause of the war, everything should be over by now. If anything, loitering around has only increased non-NATO Western support for Ukraine. And this is not some sort of vague theoretical assertion either. Remember, this is exactly how the 2008 Russo-Georgian War played out. Georgia started flirting with NATO membership. Russia propped up Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Georgia generally became less stable. NATO lost interest in expanding to Georgia. And the war ended, with Russia even withdrawing from areas it had invaded past the borders of the separatist regions. The entire arc lasted just 12 days in August and support for Georgian membership in NATO is now a distant memory. Meanwhile, back in 2022, we are sitting at 300-something days of war. That is not a good sign for the NATO theory. The other main public objection Russia had at the start of the war was control over Luhansk and Donetsk. In fact, the war began with Russia formally recognizing the regions as independent countries complete with this fancy signing ceremony. The initial phase of the war appeared to lend some credence to this being Moscow's motivating factor, with less direct focus on Crimea and more attention in the Donbass, where Russian troops extended past Luhansk up north and moved south into Mariupol, Donetsk's second largest city. But September shattered that illusion. After a series of artillery barrages against a handful of river crossings in Kherson, Russia no longer had mobility for its defensive units. Ukraine forced Moscow to decide whether to defend its gains in the north or in the south. Russia chose the south, which up until this point has nothing to do with the separatist story, and Ukraine made substantial gains up north. Yet by the end of the month, Russia was declaring that it had annexed Kherson and Zaporizhia, even as the also-annexed Luhansk was fading away, and Donetsk was never fully captured. Let's review. Russia does not care about Ukraine's NATO status. It cares relatively little about the separatist regions in the Donbass. It has suffered an estimated 100,000 dead or injured since the start of the war. And it has made no attempt to retreat to the January 2022 borders, to stem the bleeding, and entice Western states to press Kyiv to the negotiating table. The simplest way to explain all of these observable features of the war 
is that the situation in Crimea is a gigantic disaster. Imagine the reports Putin may have received toward the end of 2021. Sir, while the annexation of Crimea in 2014 was a historic triumph for the Russian Federation, the logistical situation on the ground is extremely turbulent. The peninsula's main freshwater access, a canal running from the Dnipro River, has been dammed since shortly after the annexation. In the immediate aftermath, we used a ferry line to try to service the peninsula. We knew that this would not be a viable solution over the long term, so we began work on a bridge to increase traffic flows in and out of Russia. It opened three years ago, and we were optimistic about how it would turn things around. Unfortunately, although it has stemmed the bleeding, it has not solved all of the problems we had hoped it would. A single bridge crossing is just not enough to sustain, for us, what is effectively an island of 2.1 million people. The Crimean citizens were generally supportive of us at the time of annexation, but their patience is wearing thin. Before our annexation, agriculture comprised 60% of the consumer goods Crimea produced. Unfortunately, food is no longer plentiful there. The damming of the canal immediately evaporated that number. The tourism sector also used to be big business for Crimea. There is a reason why the big three met at Yalta, and why Mikhail Gorbachev was vacationing there at the start of the August coup. But due to international economic sanctions, it is basically just Russians who are now visiting. Despite having sizable energy reserves, Crimea is still a net energy importer, relying on electricity coming from mainland Russia. The billions of dollars in this and other subsidies we have been sending to the peninsula are just not enough to overcome the geographic challenges. We worry that there will soon be organized resistance to our regional government. Worse, they live on the periphery of our federation. Compared to St. Petersburg and Moscow, our security forces do not have as strong of influence over them. If we lose control over the situation, we will have to withdraw from the Sevastopol naval base. Our secondary naval facilities on the other side of the Kerch Strait and in Rostov simply are not equipped to handle the fleet, never mind how Sevastopol's location is the superior tactical position. But we have good news. There is a solution. Further annex Ukrainian territory. We already have a foothold with our separatist operations in Luhansk and Donetsk. All we need to do is push further south in Donetsk, cross into Zaporizhia, and enter Kherson to link a land bridge from Russia to Crimea. This will solve our agricultural problems, as we can destroy the canal's dam and guarantee that it will not be rebuilt. It will also solve our logistical problems in a way that the bridge could not, as rail and road aplenty can go into Crimea from the land border. These areas voted heavily in favor of Yanukovych, and although their citizens may not be all that enthusiastic about the change in government, the right show of force will make them compliant. Of course, we cannot announce this as our motivation for the war. We would not want to make public our vulnerability in Crimea. And it is also a pure land grab. That is something that the international community frowns upon. Instead, we will rely on our default anti-NATO position. And maybe talk about Nazis. Everyone hates Nazis, right? Yes, there are risks to this strategy. If the war goes poorly and the West unites around Ukraine, we will face heavy losses. But that is a small price to pay to maintain control over the power hub that is Sevastopol. If a conversation like this took place, and that's a big if, because we are trying to use the observable features of the war to understand some otherwise puzzling behavior. It has a crucial implication for Ukraine's war tactics. At the moment, the task at hand for Kyiv might seem daunting. Russia's recent military move was to reinforce the southern side of the Dnipro River along Kherson. Thus, the most likely military path for Ukraine to take back Crimea 
is to first create a wedge in Zaporizhia to the Sea of Azov, then flank the entrenched positions, then take over the rest of Kherson, and then go into Crimea. Undoubtedly, Ukraine is going to attempt some sort of military advance like that, and given its recent successes, there is a good chance it will work. But such a military push may be unnecessary to take Crimea in the long run. Simply creating the wedge and ending the land bridge may be enough after a sufficient wait. If Russia was having problems with Crimea before Ukraine hit the metallic bridge, things have only become monumentally worse since then. Breaching the Sea of Azov seals the land bridge and leaves Russia in the untenable position that Putin's advisors might have feared back in January 2022. Actually, it is worse. Now Russia is paying to administer an area of Ukraine that has no direct value to it. Crimea will not immediately fall into Ukrainian hands, of course. It might take further degradation of the political situation in Crimea, and turnover in Putin's administration in Moscow. After all, the annexation of Crimea is one of Putin's major policy accomplishments. The anniversaries of the annexation are turned into big parties. So Putin might not easily let it go. But long-term benefits for Ukraine are better than nothing. And for now, it means Ukraine should be more willing to pay a high cost for Zaporizhia. Because it is not just Zaporizhia. It may also be the centerpiece of the conflict that began in 2014. And that's the type of win that Ukraine is ultimately seeking. How vulnerable do you think Crimea is? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you want to know more about the war, you will love my book that explains the causes of it. Check below for more information on that. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care.